right, we're in Genesis chapter 29. If you want to uh, turn there as we look at the tribes of Israel beginning, we saw Jacob head on his way to look for a wife last week at the instruction of his father Isaac, fresh off the deception of his brother Esau, where he does receive the blessing, which was God's, God's uh, will for him to, to have that while the children were still in the mother's womb. Remember, God told uh, uh, Rachel that, uh, you know, you have two nations within you. The younger will serve uh, the older. Isaac rebelled against that uh, and favored his, uh, his son Esau that we uh, likened to the uh, living beer commercial that he was. And uh, so a lot of strife there uh, in the family growing up. Isaac finally, with the realization that he's been deceived, and in fact, Jacob did receive the blessing, realized that it was God's doing and, and repented. We saw a little bit of that uh, uh, last week. And then, of course, when he sends him off, he reiterates that, that blessing to him once again. Jacob goes on his way, and, uh, and once he's on his way, he spends that first night in a desolate place, puts his head down on a stone pillow, and God gives him a dream, a vision, where he peers before him uh, in a ladder or a stairway that, uh, with angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth. And um, we have God at the top, his voice at least speaking uh, and saying this, Behold, I am with you. Verse 15 of the previous chapter will keep you wherever you go, bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Practical terms, uh, we said that God was saying that the angels, the ladder, and I'm going with you. This is the, the access to me. This is my presence, and I'm going to go with you all the way and bring you back into this land once again. Now, we're going to see that uh, as, uh, as Jacob heads off, <laughs> it actually says something about him going his way, and literally it means he, he lifted up his feet <laughs> the next morning and went. And, uh, and the yellow brick road spread out in front of him, and he said, I'm off to see my people, the wonderful people of her. And uh, I can't remember the rest of the song, but they, I think they made it to a movie later, but they changed it to a little girl and a dog. But uh, he lifted up his feet. And so, I mean, he, and he buys into this. He's really trusting the Lord. He makes this vow. Remember the if and the then. Uh, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread and to eat, and clothing to put on. He's not asking for much. So that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. So he's saying, I'm, I want a personal relationship with God. He's my God. He'll be my God. So this is a, a real turning point for Jacob and his relationship uh, uh, with the Lord. We see, it's not a strong statement of faith, the if and then then. That's never a good thing when we're saying that to the Lord. Well, Lord, if you do this, then I'll do this. It's better just to say, Lord, whatever your will is, you know, and then I, I'm going to go along with it. This idea of doing God's will and submitting to it becomes, well, it's kind of a sticking point in the story uh, as we get to it here. Very interesting, the decision that he has to make confronted with, very tough decision. I think that you'll agree once we, we look at it, but it's the beginning of the tribes of Israel, and we'll look at the, the 11 children that are born out of these marriages, plural, that come about because he makes his trip to Haran to look for a bride. So let's look at Jacob arriving in the first 14 verses uh, there. So Jacob went on his journey, came to the land of the people of the east, and he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was over the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there. And they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Then he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. So he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, Look, it's still high day. Is it not time for cattle to be gathered together? Water the sheep and go and feed them. You don't mind me bossing you around. I realize I'm the new guy here, but I thought I pointed out you're just totally blowing it here by what you're doing. That's what's going on. There's a little, little animosity. They should have been watering and get, getting going, and they were just kind of hanging out. Oh, Jacob feels the liberty just to 
give it to him a little bit here. We see a little of his personality uh, uh, coming out. But they said, uh, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together. And they, they, someone else, has rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we will water the sheep. Verse 9, now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran uh, and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report that Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. So he arrives and, and things are looking pretty good here. This idea of God's promise. God says, hey, I'm going with you. My presence is with you. I'm going to watch out over you and so forth. And when he gets there and shows up and he comes to this well, and then he finds out that he's in the right place. He's not only in the right place, but you know, they know uh, the man, his uncle, that he's looking for, Laban, and he's well. That's great news. Not only that, they say, and here comes Rachel, who is his daughter. Uh, Jacob's looking for a wife, and we're going to find out she's pretty good looking. And, uh, and so he sees that. He gets so excited uh, he goes and, and moves the stone, which is supposed to be like what two or three or four guys do. I mean, that's what these guys are waiting. There's a group of them, and they're going to move the thing and move it back. He's excited. And uh, he had to be thinking, all right, Lord, you're so good. Just what you said. You're keeping your promises to me. He's going to hit a point in time where that ladder is going to get real fuzzy in the heavens, and he's going to be wondering uh, where the Lord is at. Notice he hurries towards uh, the people of the east or Mesopotamia. Just a couple of quick facts here. Remember that, uh, that he's going to Haran, not Ur of the Chaldeans. Remember Abraham originally left Ur of the Chaldeans, but they had to travel that fertile crescent, go up and back down again, follow the water source. And on the way, remember Abraham who leaves with, his, his, uh, with Sarah, with Lot, with Terah, his father, and they stay there. They stay in that city of Haran. Now, it's interesting. One of the reasons they may have done that, uh, although that's not what God told them to do, is that we know from uh, archaeologists uh, that the city of Ur and the city of Haran were tied together because they both worshipped the same moon god. Both major cities at that time. We talked about the complexity of Ur and what an quote, advanced civilization it was in terms of the city layout and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and very urban, very developed, but these two cities are tied together. So he's not going all the way to Ur, down by the Persian Gulf. He is going uh, just to Haran. Uh, apparently, we find also in Scripture that Abraham's brother, Nahor, has gone with him. So when Abraham, Terah dies, Abraham continues on with Sarah with Lot and this whole entourage that's now with him, but Nahor stays. So when Abraham's servant goes back to get a wife for Isaac, he doesn't go to Ur of the Chaldeans, he goes to Haran. So that's why he's in this location as well. It is in present day northern Iraq. Right now you read about some of the problems and, skir and skirmishes that the Kurds are having in the north in that mountainous area where it borders with Turkey. And, um, and there's some fighting and stuff going on. That's the area. That's where he went to. That's where the servant of Abraham went to to get a wife uh, as well. And certainly, uh, Jacob had to be at least thinking a little bit about the fact that as he gets there and he's at the right place, that he's at a, he's at a well. And he had to have heard the story many times about Abraham's servant. Remember, he goes and he's very concerned about this task of of finding a wife for his master son, which is pretty important, <laughs> and wanting to make sure he gets the, uh, uh, the right gal. And he shows up, and remember, he does a, a if and a then prayer also. Lord, I pray if a woman comes out and offers to water all of my camels, which we talked about would have taken two or three hours of hard labor to do. It wasn't a, a simple task. If she does that, uh, then I'll know she's the one. And of course, you know, uh, Rachel comes out, 
and, uh, or, and, uh, and does that, and then she turns out to be a close relative, and they go home, and it all works out. And he had to have heard this, this story, this incredible God providence kind of a story and finding a wife. So now he, where does he go? He's looking for a wife. He's looking for his family. He goes to a, a well. Now, uh, I did this in the first service. I have to do it again. I'm just, I was kind of shocked. <clears throat> how many of you know the story of how your parents met? You know how your parents met. See, uh, that's better. I, I thought it was going to be like 98%. The first service was like half. It's like, give me a break. You've never asked your parents how they met? Come on, <laughs> you know? And uh, but you're part of your history. You, you need to know these things. But uh, anyway, my, I told my dad's story in the, uh, in the first service. I don't know if I should tell uh, Kathy's uh, mom in the second. But uh, uh, anyway, they're uh, both fascinating. But uh, he had to have known his, his whole uh, this whole story of God working things out for his own mother and father. So he finds himself at a well. He knows God's promise to be with him. He's got to be thinking, maybe it would happen again. And then he ends up in this conversation with the, the shepherds that are pretty much uh, kicked back, apparently getting paid by the hour. And uh, they're, <laughs> they're taking it easy. And uh, not, they don't have a real stake in the uh, the sheep business, so to speak. So they're, they're taking it easy. And, uh, and uh, Jacob's kind of given it to him a little bit about why don't you just do what you're supposed to do and then get back out so that your cattle, your sheep can be grazing, growing fat, which is what they're supposed to be doing. And uh, uh, it, it's interesting that he shows up and kind of gets into it with them a little bit. Uh, again, some of the teaching, some of the things we hear about Jacob, we're trying to dispel. You know, the idea that he's dirty, sneaky thief, again, is the name that his brother, who hates his guts, gives him. It's not really uh, his name. Now, he's caught up in the deception. We also hear that he's kind of a mama's boy because he stayed at the tent, but Big Red, the living beer commercial brother, is out, you know, hunting all the time. Uh, but uh, we don't find that at all. We find that he's, we're going to find out that uh, he moves the stone by himself, a stone that normally took two or three or four guys, gets a little excited seeing Rachel, and uh, thinking, all right, God is in this, man. I'm, you know, the Lord is with me. Watch this. And he moves this stone by himself, which tells us that, well, you know, Esau's the twin brother, not identical apparently, but twin. And he was pretty much probably a, a pretty big, beefy guy like his, uh, his brother was and is able to pull this, uh, pull this off. But uh, the other shepherds are quick to uh, point out Rachel's arrival. They probably had enough with Jacob's uh, rebuke at this point. And they say in verse 6, uh, uh, look, here's his daughter, Rachel's coming with the sheep. Uh, and, of course, then he says, uh, yeah, it's, it's still high day. Isn't that time for the cattle to be gathered together? Water the sheep and go and feed them. So he arrives. He has a conversation. The Lord's with him. He's at the right place. He's not only at the right place. He's at the right time because, well, his close relative, uh, Rachel, is coming. Verse 9, now while he was still speaking with him, Rachel, which uh, again her name means lamb or you lamb, female lamb, comes with her father's lambs because she was someone that took care of lambs. There's a little, little play on, uh, on words there. And then verse 11, all the gals already that have read ahead have this underline, then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. But actually, that's not really what's going on here. He wasn't like seeing her and the slow motion things going. Yeah, actually, uh, it's the same word for kiss that he gets from Laban. It's the same word that's used when Laban kisses his grandchildren. So this is just the kiss that some of you guys interchanged while we were. Uh, it's just that kiss on the cheek kind of a thing. It's just a greeting. He really isn't like madly in love with her. We find out that he is greatly in love with her later, but I don't know that it would be a stretch to call this love at, love at first sight here, although he certainly uh, uh, notices her, and he's very excited. But I think he's more excited about the fact that he lifts up his voice and he weeps, that God's word is really true. You know, I'm so, remember when God says this to, to Jacob, he just lied and cheated. I mean, he's running and being punished for his own sin, and he's on the run from everything because he has to, and he's left everything behind because of his own sin. And God shows up and doesn't rebuke him. God shows up and says, it's going to be all right. I'm with you. I got a plan for you. I'm going to watch over you. I mean, it had just to be a complete shock to him. And, uh, and then he lifted up his feet, headed down that yellow brick road. And now Rachel shows up. 
and she's pretty good looking, and she's like, everything is right about this whole thing. I don't know if you've ever been to that, well, you know, where it's like you're trusting God, and everything is working out, it's just all happening. You're looking for that place to live, and you find the perfect place. You're looking for the job, and it's the perfect job. And you think, God is good, you know? God is good all the time. You're, you know, you're saying the slogans, you're praising the Lord, you know, you've got your CD in and worshiping the Lord, but boy, the bombshell's coming here, isn't it, for Jacob? And uh, he's going to have to change gears uh, pretty, pretty fast here. Uh, he arrives. He's at the right place and at the right time. Rachel's there. Now Laban comes. Laban hears the news about Jacob, his sister's son, and he runs out to meet him. Now remember, the last time we saw Laban, again, the servant of Abraham is there. How did the servant of Abraham show up? He shows up with 10 camels loaded with gold and clothing and this huge dowry. And remember, we said about camels in that day were not as domesticated as they would become eventually. If you had one of those, it was like owning a Lamborghini or something today or a Maserati or something. You're just very rare. You're pretty wealthy to have a camel. This guy's got 10. He's probably got a whole bunch of people with weapons, you know, with him as well. And he shows up. Hey, I'm the servant of Abraham and, you know, your sister and da 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 da. Laban was pretty happy to see him. And, uh, and uh, they cut a deal pretty quick. Yeah, she'll go with you right now. No problem. What do you got? And, you know, and they're laying out the gold and paying the dowry and stuff. So now, you know, here, you know, Rebecca, you know, uh, Rachel comes running back and finds out that, uh, hey, you remember the servant? You remember Isaac and, you know, and, you know, and your sister and the son is here. Wonder how many camels he's got. Man, what a disappointment when he got there. Hey, good to see you. Hugs and kisses him. Are the other guys coming soon? Are they kind of behind you? Where's the rest of the caravan? Just me and my little donkey here. <laughs> In fact, I'm on the run. <laughs> what a disappointment for poor Laban, you know. He had to be pretty excited. He's just thinking, you know, ka-ching, ka-ching, all the way there until he gets to him. But Laban's a smart guy, realized, oh, this kid's desperate. He's vulnerable. This could still work. This could still work. You know, I got a lot to do. I've got a lot of sheep to take care of. I got some free labor coming here. I can see this already. So Laban, Laban's doing his thing and he's getting ready. Why? Because God needs Laban. God needs Laban in Jacob's life. Because uh, who's Jacob? Jacob's going to become the prince of God, but he's a long ways from it. And uh, he needs a Laban in his life. We would say he needed some trimming because he needed a compassionate spirit. He needed to experience some pain because he needed to learn humility. He needed a dimension to his character that simply was not there yet. And he needed to learn to trust God and not himself, which was a major issue. Now, I know that's not an issue for any of us, but you might have some friends that have this problem once in a while in their walk with the Lord. And, uh, and sometimes what happens to them is that God brings a Laban. God brings somebody along. Well, is Jacob going to get ripped off? Man, he's really going to get ripped off. Does God allow it? Yep, he allows it because he wants to do something with Jacob's life. And, uh, and God does do that and brings Labans into our lives, people that rub us the wrong way, people that even rip us off sometimes because we need some trimming. We might have a compassionate spirit. We need to experience some pain because we need to learn humility. And God wants to develop an added dimension to our character and our faith that we might stop trusting ourselves. So Jacob arrives, and in his mind, things are looking pretty good at this point. In Laban's mind, it's not the best case scenario. There weren't 10 camels loaded with gold, but it's not bad either. This kid seems pretty healthy. Might be able to get a little bit of work out of him while he's there. After all, he is his own flesh and blood. Secondly, we notice that uh, Jacob agrees to work for his bride. Verse 15, then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. 
And they seemed as only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. That's the other one the gals have underlined there. But uh, uh, seemed only a few days. Now, what's interesting uh, about this is, you know, the agreement again to work for seven years. Uh, Laban's introduction of the idea of money is followed by the uh, ominous verse 16. Uh, Tell me, what should my wages be? Now, Laban had two daughters, and they're both going to come into the play, of course, if you, if you know the story. And uh, the thing about this is very interesting. Their descriptions, of course, Leah, who is the older and is described as, well, this New King James says, uh, says delicate eyes. Uh, it's the same word that's used in Proverbs 51 when it says a soft, a soft answer turns away wrath. That's the same word, soft, delicate, tender, uh, so it, it doesn't mean that she's not attractive at all or somehow. I mean, these two gals are, are sisters, but it's just that in comparison to her sister, uh, Rachel, who was, quote, beautiful in form, and that beautiful, uh, again, structurally applies to appearance as, uh, as well. It's the same word that's used for, Rachel, for Sarah when it describes the fact that she was beautiful. It's the Hebrew word Haifa, which is the beautiful city on the north coast of, uh, of Israel today. So two sisters, one is older than the other one. One apparently is a knockout, and the other one, it doesn't mean that she's not attractive, but not as attractive. And I'm sure there was like no competition between these two sisters at all, and they were just really close to one another. Well, we're going to see that that's really not the case uh, as we go on here. Uh, Jacob agrees. Uh, to the seven years, and he agrees specifically, notice, to work for Rachel, the younger, the younger daughter. The other thing that's interesting about this is that, well, this is the dowry, and the normal dowry, if you didn't have the money up front, is you would work about three years, four at the tops, seven. And I had to go back and look, whose idea was it to, to work seven? This had to be Laban, right, ripping them off. No, actually, uh, it's Jacob. He's the one that says, what will your wages be? I'll, I'll work for Rachel for seven years. Very interesting. This does go with the whole thing of his love for her. I mean, he's saying, yes, yeah, she's worth three years, four at the tops. I'll do seven. That's what I think of her. And, then, and she, she had to know, you think that meant anything to her? Wow, must really love me. <laughs> he kind of uh, up the ante here. Uh, and he agrees to work for seven years, but again, but it seemed only a few days for him because he loved Rachel. So again, in that culture and so forth, they, they would have some interaction. It's not like they're going out on dates on Friday night or anything, you know, uh, things are done very properly, very modestly and so forth. They have some interaction. The relationship is obviously developing anticipation of their, their wedding that would be coming in seven. That's a long engagement, isn't it? I mean, seven, that's kind of a long time, seven years. Wow. I mean, he's no kid when he gets there. You know, it's not like he's like 17 and we better put this off for a while. That was a long time. That's a, that's a big dowry. That is a lot of sacrifice there. So he arrives and it appears to be at the right place at the right time. He agrees to work for his bride and it seems like days to him. And when he looks up at the stars at night, man, he sees angels ascending and descending in a stairway and God's at the top saying, you're doing good, man. We're right on. And he's like, he's feeling it. God is good. Jacob's all right. It's all going to change here. Verse 21. <laughs> he has to ask for his bride. Verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her, and Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter, Leah, as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Did I mention that? <laughs> Fulfill your week, and we will give you this one also for the service, which you will serve with me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so, fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife also, and Laban gave his maid Bila to his daughter Rachel as a maid, then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still 
another seven years. So he completes the seven years, and notice he has to ask. You know, there's not like, okay, the time is up. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure Jacob was counting the days, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a strongly suggest that <clears throat> Laban's holding out. It's not please. It's just give me my wife is, is the idea here. Uh, but then Laban complies, jumps in, hey, we'll have a feast, we'll do it, you know, and gathers all the men. And, and, uh, and, and the process of, of this wedding procession would have been, again, a procession from the bride's home to the place they would hold the wedding. There'd be some, uh, like, vows that were said, in a sense, like a marriage contract. They would be feasting all day, and then the couple would go into the honeymoon suite or tent. And, uh, and then the feasting would continue for the other, the other six days. The whole thing is a week. So when he wakes up the next morning, uh, of course, we've got a switch. We've got uh, Leah instead uh, of Rachel. Now, again, sometimes we look at this and go, does this, how does this happen? Uh, this still happens. I'm, I'm watching a, a show on, on Nat Geo a, a few years ago about weddings in the Middle East. And I thought, I'm going to watch this. And they actually showed a gal getting married in the, in the veil. The veil is like we would think of a, a burqa. I mean, it's the complete covering. You don't see anything. And, uh, and, and it's not taken off until the morning after. So it, this is all totally, pl not only plausible, the show I was watching, two Swiss sisters got switched, just like in this story, in this little documentary that's being filmed. And not only did it happen, it, it still happens apparently from, uh, from time to time. But uh, we see the veil situation earlier uh, in Genesis 24, 65, uh, there with uh, Jacob's father. Uh, where, uh, again, we have uh, Rachel coming, uh, and she's riding the camels, and she's coming into the land, and, and she knows she's in that area. And then you've got uh, Isaac, and he's out in the evening meditating on the word of God, sees the camels, he comes over, and he's running in slow motion because he knows that's his bride. <coughs> and uh, you have to run in slow motion when you're in love, of course. Uh, and then she, uh, she says this, who is this man walking uh, in slow motion in the field to meet us? Uh, and the servant said, uh, it is my master. And so notice, so she took a veil and covered herself. He doesn't get to see her until after the wedding. It's the, and we've got uh, other incidents we'll see in Genesis as well, where there's a deception through a woman wearing a veil, and the guy doesn't, thinks it's someone else that it's, uh, that it's not. So uh, I've actually got a, a picture of Rachel when she still surfed. Uh, there she is. <laughs> Down Ur the Chaldeans, uh, there was surf in that area. So that's the, the uh, surfing veil. I just wanted to point that out. There's a lot of veils. Surfing veil is different than a wedding veil. I didn't have a good shot of the wedding veil, but uh, uh, nonetheless, there's a, uh, there's a way, to, way to surf, I guess, in that part of the world for the gals. But uh, two things about uh, these two sisters and the whole scheme of thing. Uh, with a couple of thoughts. One is, uh, what did Laban have to do to uh, restrain Rachel? You think Rachel's like, oh, hey, yeah, no problem. Older sister switches later. Yeah, it's, I'm good with it. I, don't, I think she was probably a little ticked off. Uh, they might have had to tie her up. I mean, it, literally, to keep this was happening. You think she's real happy with her sister? I don't think so. They may not have been gotten along that good to start with, but uh, now they're like, I don't think they're close, close sisters. Uh, and then Leah has got to be able to, uh, she might, has to be willing, right? I mean, she may have been attracted to Jacob, thought he was a great guy, and sees this as, uh, hey, yeah, sounds good to me. This is my shot. I'll take it. What about your sister? Could care less. I mean, you know, I mean, she's, she, she can't love, have a lot of love for her sister if she's going to deceive and, and, and take her husband that she'd been waiting for seven years to, to marry. So there's a uh, there's a lot of fiery drama going on. And then uh, L Laban's going like, gotcha. <laughs> well, how about seven more years? You know, so I'm going to get you for four times the normal dowry. You know, no camels, no gold. You know, I'll find a way. You know, I'll work this thing out. So Jacob, the next morning, then asked, secondly, why he was deceived. And uh, what is this you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you, and there's that word, deceived me? And we have to, we have to kind of wonder because uh, the word deceived in the Hebrew comes from the same stem used to describe Jacob's deception of Esau when he stole his blessing. Deceive, deceive. 
Jacob, does that word kind of echo in your mind at all? Whether it does or not, it does in Moses, and he makes sure he uses those same kinds of words that we understand what's going on. That uh, here's a guy that was, deception was part of what sent him on this road, and then now it's coming back to him uh, once again. The extortion, we would say, was uh, immense, uh, and uh, what happens, of course, then uh, he has to, the request is, we'll continue in the other six days for the wedding feast and finish the the wedding week, and then we'll have another wedding, and you can marry uh, Rachel, and then you can consider, and then continue those six days, and then finish out your, your seven years. And of course, in both cases, he's given, or the gals are given handmaidens that become concubines, and they are given culturally for that reason. If she's unable to conceive, she will conceive on her behalf. If she's unable to conceive or not as many children as you like, she will conceive the rest of the children. So he goes, he goes from not being married to having four wives uh, in a period of two weeks, and they just really all love each other. It's just such a beautiful picture <laughs> that they've got going here. Uh, amazing, amazing. They, uh, they all live happily ever after, and that's how the story is. Now, a recipe for, for misery. Sister wives, one beautiful, one less beautiful. Uh, the less uh, basically probably favored all along, uh, and now uh, the dynamic and the relationship would continue, as it says, and Jacob would continue to love Rachel, uh, Rachel more. Uh, a couple of things about this is that um, uh, let's just talk about Leah for a minute and, uh, and we'll, we'll get into the, uh, she's the first one that starts conceiving and God gives her four sons right in a row. And um, we would say that Jacob was faced with a pretty tough decision here, wasn't he? What, what was God's will for him? To have multiple wives? Uh-uh. Uh, ab absolutely not. It, uh, the creation account says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, singular, and they will become one flesh. And every time someone, whether it's one of the patriarchs, didn't work out real well for his grandfather, did it? Uh, you know, every time one of the patriarchs or later one of the kings of Israel succumbs to the cultural norm of the day, it's disastrous. It's disastrous uh, for uh, for their family. So this is kind of a tough one here, right? I mean, he, he's like, God is with me. God's working this out. I'm trusting God. This is, this is awesome. I'm at the right place. I'm at the right time. This gal is beautiful. Hey, Laban's in uh, seven years. Seems like a day to me. And I wake up the next day and it's the, uh, it's the older sister. It, it's not the idea that she wasn't as beautiful. I don't think that's the issue. It's just she, she's the wrong person. So what's his options at that point? Well, option one is the one he did. I'll just go back and complain enough that he gives me both of them. And uh, I don't care if I got to work another seven years, even though I'm really only supposed to be here for a little while, for days, and I've been here seven years already. And the point of my coming was to make sure I married someone who wasn't a Canaanite. That was the instructions from my father. God says he'll be with me and he'll bless me and he'll get me back to the land and I'll have his blessing. Why not just follow God's will? What's God's will? Pack it up, take your wife, and head on back. Would that be an easy thing to do? That'd be tough. That'd be tough. Man, if Jacob was able to pull that off, if he said, you know, Rachel, honey, I love you, but I'm married to Leah now, and God says one wife. And uh, I'm not happy about this, but I'm going with God on this one. What happens then? Well, Leah has six kids that make up six of the 12 tribes of Israel. She has Levi, as we'll see next week. All the priests come from her. She has Judah. David comes from her and the lineage of Jesus Christ. We've been okay with six tribes of Israel right there. How about their lives? Would that worked out and been better? Did God bless Jacob anyway? I mean, I mean in terms of uh, materially and, and so forth, yeah. But his life was miserable after this in terms of relationship. It, it's just horrific. But that's a tough, that's a tall order for Jacob, right? I mean, to, that'd be tough. 
Sometimes we fight, face stuff like that, right? It's, we're all good when, when it's like right place, right time. God's working it out. Everything's good. Glory, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then we hit something really hard like, you expect me to what? <laughs> no, this is what I want to do. My career, stop now, do this instead? You're kidding me. I mean, you know, God sometimes brings things, puts roadblocks, things in our lives you know, I've been dealing with the labor for seven years already, Lord, and now this? And, uh, and God does stuff like that. He says, so how much do you trust me? It's not what you want. Are you willing to say, it's not what I want, it's not what I feel, it's not what I want. I'm just going to kind of submit to you, and this is going to be hard. But, Lord, I'm in. That'd be, that, he doesn't do it, obviously. But that's, that's a tough one. But God brings tough stuff to us sometimes. It says, how much will you trust me instead of trusting your, yourself? <clears throat> Again, was it God's will for Jacob to have two wives or four? No, uh, it was only one. Jacob also was the elect son of God, we would say, but he didn't escape the consequences of his own sins. And in fact, because of who he's going to become, the prince of God, we'd say he gets some special, some special discipline uh, along the way. But because of this decision to go on and marry Rachel, though... Yeah, obviously, he really loved her. Uh, his decision to do that, we'll see as we continue to study, brings about a lot of misery, man. There's a lot of misery. These kids, and one's favored over the other. They hate each other's guts. I mean, this thing goes on. They're about, you know, some, there's some, we got some tough sled in here, some chapters here, some bad stuff that happened with, these are not good boys. I can just tell you that, the way this thing is going to turn out. A lot of people are going to die. Uh, literally, before this thing is over with. Does God work all things together for good? Yeah, Rachel has a kid named Joseph, and he saves them all. Amazing. He makes this very bad decision. And God, but God's promise to him is, I'm going with you, I'm going to watch over you, I'm going to keep you safe, I'm bringing you back in the land. Because I've got a greater thing going on here, it's called the redemption of mankind. You got a little thing going on, you're going to play a part of it. You may make some bad decisions and not trust me, but I'm not giving up on you, and we're still going forward. All things are going to work together for good for, for Jacob. Remember, he's the guy that could sing Amazing Grace, all this toil and strain, and, uh, and so much that we can learn from his life. We don't always like the decisions that he makes, but certainly we sure love how God deals with him. Ellen Ross once said of uh, this idea of the Labans in our life, take a long look at ourselves. It may be that some of those traits of other people characterize us and that other people may be part of God's means of, of disciplining us. God allows sometimes people to come into our lives that are like us, and we don't often like it. Man, I can't stand that guy. You know, he's so, you know, pushy. He's so judgmental. He's so, yeah. And then after a while, you realize sometimes that, wow, I think that guy's kind of like me. Wow, I don't, I don't think I like that. I don't think I like that in me. Lord, I think we better do some business here. You know, sometimes God, you know, you know our sin always looks worse on someone else. <laughs> it's really not that bad on us, but man, it always looks bad on someone else. And sometimes God will use his word as a mirror. Sometimes he'll use other people as well. But uh, he's doing that in the life of Jacob because he's got a purpose. He's got a plan for him. He's part of the whole redemption thing that's going to go on, as he does for each and every one of us. You know, it's always how will we react? How will we see it? Will we just shine it on or we recognize, God, you're showing me, you're teaching me, and I'll just say, I need some help here. I need, uh, I'm calling out here, Lord. I need to be forgiven. I need to be cleansed. I need some help here because I recognize that I'm not like, like that, and when I see it on them, I don't like it. I don't want to be that way. I, I, I hope you're, you're, you're open to seeing that. I can tell you that's a, a lot of how I came to the Lord because I finally realized who I really was, and I didn't like it at all. I had become the kind of person that I despised, and I didn't like it. But God can work, and God can change. And even like Jacob, he can take even the bad decisions of the past and use it all for good. All things do work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Jacob's a great example of that. Well, let's pray.